no man who has taken time to holistically give himself to the word of God has not proved it that it works. The word of God cannot fail because this is the absoluteness of his power. An open invitation to a life in the word. Because you have received the faith of Christ and you have embraced the righteousness of God through faith. Grace and peace are multiplied. That is why we lay hands on the lame and they walk. We lay hands on the blind and they see. We lay hands on the deaf and they hear. It's powerful enough to give you the answer on its first application. Arise on the wings of revelation. Align your destiny. Transform your world. This is Fenero Make Manifest with Apostle Grace Lubega. Welcome your neighbor to the last Sunday service they are they are next year next year it's gonna be another level tell your neighbor next year it's gonna be another level praise God eh <laughs> up there is full overflow I don't know you, yes I'm there I'm not here I'm in the overflow right now Praise the Lord. You may take your seats. Squire, thank you very much for that wonderful ministration. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. This evening we have a partner's service. So it starts at five and it should end at seven sharp, except the spirit pushes further. But seven sharp is going to be the end of the service. So those of you who are partners who have been contacted, please keep time. We want to show you, you know, our books, but also I have a message, a prophetic message for you. 2024. Hallelujah. 2024. So please keep time. I know it's going to be a hard toll for you, especially for the people who have done two, three services because you're serving. But hey, I just flew back on Thursday evening and I was on the altar on Friday and Friday morning I was in the office, so you're not busier than me. Make it on time. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Allow me to bless our offerings. Father, we worship you this afternoon with our giving and I know that you'll supply every man's need according to your riches in glory in Christ Jesus. As we've always done in Jesus' mighty name and all saints say it. Amen. Are you ready for the word? Yeah. Hallelujah. My mandate this afternoon comes from the book of Acts, the 15th chapter, the 18th verse. If you will read with me, the Bible says, Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. In simpler English, God knows whatever he has been doing since the world began. He knows every bit of it. He has not missed one step, gone out of course in any way. He knows everything he's doing. Very powerful, very powerful, very powerful portion of scripture. And I'll tell us why. All of us at one time have gone through very, very hard circumstances. All of us at one time have been tested through very painful experiences. And some of us have gone through harder experiences than others. Some of you, you lost a job once when you needed it most. Somebody's house was taken by the bank once because they would not pay their monthly uh, installments. There's somebody in this room who went through a very hard divorce, maybe two divorces or three. There's somebody here who dropped out of school early 
against their will. The circumstances in their home would not allow for them to have a wonderful education. Some of you were physically abused when you were growing up. Some time ago, a couple of years ago, not very long ago actually, it was in COVID, I met a story of a lady who was raped by a man. Then she had a child, but she was raped at 12, 14, 12, yes, 12. And then when her child made 12, she was raped by the very man who raped her, the mother at 12. And that very man who raped her, she was forced to get married to. People go through stuff. There's somebody here who has suffered loss maybe a couple of years ago. Maybe you suffered loss this year of a dear one, a father, a mother, a child. Some of you are total orphans since you were little. We all vary in our challenges. And in the years to come, you'll go through something hard. Some of you have not yet seen hard times and maybe they'll come one day. But it's important, and I'm going to emphasize this, it's important to go through whatever you're going through with the revelation of the mind of God, with the revelation of the heart of God. Because there are instances or circumstances under which we can judge or have judged God because like we have seen the tests or trials that some of the biblical figures we have read have gone through, which are the very things that we go through every day. We have also, in the same text, seen God sometimes act indifferent, quote and unquote, sometimes act unbothered, sometimes act careless, quote and unquote. Sometimes God acts like he's not interested to know what we're going through. Maybe you had a sick person that you treated and prayed for, fasted, even promised to do this and that and gave a seed, but that person eventually died. Or probably like I, I worked in hospice once, a palliative care institution, where I saw little kids dying of cancer. And there was nothing in the world you could do. You pray, you fast. Then you start asking yourself questions. Is God really watching this? Some of you have given up on certain things concerning the faith. I met a group of people who don't believe in divine healing anymore. And probably you went through a circumstance, a situation yourself prayed for your loved one or prayed for yourself, your loved one was not healed or you have not healed this far, then you concluded divine healing does not exist. I don't believe in divine healing. You can convince them all you want, but they are bent on having tried to prove it one day. And they fail to see the manifestation of what they believe God for. And from that day, out of anger, decided to judge things that way. And sadly, it does not even help further because we live in a more indifferent dispensation, especially with the newer versions of Christianity, neo-Pentecostalism. People who only appeal to your rational mind, who can only understand to reason and logic, to whom if you can't explain something scientifically, it cannot be true. And so they've also amassed themselves a group of people who, as the Bible says and prophesied that it shall be, that in the last days, you know, they will give heed to seducing spirits. They will want people to speak what their eating ears want to hear. So in a generation where pastors or ministers are earning their right and place in the hearts of men because they are speaking the things people want to hear. So the Bible speaks of a time where people will not endure sound doctrine. Endure. Imagine you get to a point where you cannot endure. It's, it doesn't work anymore for you. You feel a frustration in your spirit and an agitation in your soul every time the 
truth is preached. And this is the time where people cannot endure, but after their own lusts, they heap themselves teachers because their ears are itching to speak what they want to hear. So these newer breed of ministers, they don't talk about the Holy Spirit. They don't talk about the infield, the baptism. They cannot talk about the demonstration of power and the healing power of God. Why? Because they're going to be asked to prove and probably they'll heal one or two and they can't explain why the other three or four died and then the you know, paparazzi are going to be on their heads. They're going to be sued in court and you know, people are going to see them indifferent. Why? Because they want to be politically correct. And so they choose the road, I think they call it, of least resistance. Preach something that's just enough for, you know, people to agree and understand. Don't go beyond, you know, a certain boundary. Don't push the envelope. Don't stand on the risk of faith. It's not wise. They call it wisdom. To stay complacent and their own are dying of cancers and incurable diseases. They could have been healed if these people persisted to teach faith. We're not that kind of people. We will teach faith. We will teach truth. Yes, people will misunderstand us and some might not heal because of that. But we have testimonies that are undeniable. And I've found it so strange when I've sat people uh, to show them the testimonies of what God has done. Somebody has not walked for 10 years, 17 years, 20 years. You've seen them. Had a car accident or got a disease. You remember one of those years where a boy was crippled and with a hunchback and he could not walk in his life. You remember that boy who straightened up before our eyes for the first time he walked. He was born crippled and bent. This boy started running. You have all these testimonies some of you have seen with your very own eyes and you bring all this proof to somebody and he still wants to find another reason why or way to explain how this person could have walked being born crippled or having lived crippled for many years except that it's the miracle working power of God. That's the generation we live in. Hallelujah. So it even worsens when people go through hard times because they cannot have any template to refer to. Are you following me? So yes, we go scriptural and see that there are instances where God has been indifferent. You'd think he doesn't care. You'd think he's not touched by what we go through. And I'll give you three examples of that. Only three of the many that I could use. In John eleven twenty one. 21, this woman tells Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. This is her judging Jesus. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. You need to go back a bit and understand the story to understand where Martha is coming from. Lazarus, her brother, you know there were three. We know Lazarus, we know Martha and Mary. At least we know that those three were siblings. Could have had more, we don't know, but the scriptures tell us of those three. The Bible tells us that Jesus was a friend to Lazarus. He loved Lazarus. In fact, when they go to Jesus to tell him about Lazarus' plight, the scriptures say, they came to Jesus and told him, the one whom you love is sick. Now imagine they tell you about somebody you love so dearly and they say, this person is sick. What's the first response? You'd want to do everything in your right and power to get them well. Now, this is Jesus. He's been healing the sick, opening blind eyes, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, doing miracles, signs, and wonders all around. They know that this man has the ability. It's within his strength and power to heal a man which is dying. So, because he's been your friend, you'd expect that by reason of being close, he should actually act even more efficiently faster than anybody else who does not know you. It's like going to hospital. If you were a doctor, right? And they told you, oh, there's a lady who is not well. And you've been working from morning till 3 p.m. or 4 p.m. and you're feeling dizzy and you, you want to have some sugar in your body. You'd say, if this lady can wait, could she give me five or 10 minutes? Let me have my, some breakfast or so, some food. And then I can come back and attend to her, right? And rightly so, you need the time to rest. Or you know, fill this body with some food. But imagine 
in that very hospital they tell you your best friend is about to die or your mother is about to die and she's the one in the next room do you know you're going to forget even the food and run to them why because of the attachment that you have with this individual this in retrospect is what i think lazarus expected of the lord martha expected of the lord mary expected of the lord all of those which knew jesus expected that this fellow was going to act real time to go and run to rescue his friend which was dying i can imagine what lazarus is, is thinking i ate with this guy we've been hanging together we have history together i helped him do this i helped them do that now look up at a point where i need him badly and this man cannot appear can't he at least sacrifice a few minutes firstly heal me and then go attend to the other duties besides i'm his friend i feel the betrayal i feel the frustration i feel the questions is he really my friend are there more important matters for him to attend to than the dying friend etc etc and i can see lazarus die and i can see people come to condole them and i see the indifferent anonymous people the strange ones who are always on every funeral who want to find reason of, of why somebody should have died and then they are also in a grief process uh, either some are in denial or some are still in the anger you know grief has a process and so they start now blaming everyone now why, why didn't they take him to hospital in, on time why didn't they now i see the mamara standing on the side and say but jesus was his friend what happened huh? ah but this jesus guy is also that's the process problem some sometimes you might put your trust in this man and he's your friend but maybe he was also busy okay? So you see people who are also judging, you know, he was his friend. And then you see those few ladies who are studying in the corner also gossiping. Why well, he wasn't his friend. No, he was his friend. No, he wasn't. I promise you. If this man could enter a house of Ezekiel, he didn't know. What about his friend? No, he wasn't Jesus' friend. He was just tying himself on him. I told you, pray for me. Things come here at the speed of light. Hallelujah. So everybody's judging their matters to why the Christ has not appeared. Maybe there's a fellow who didn't believe in Jesus and hated him with all his guts. And they say, you see, I told you. These guys you call him, his Lord, his Lord. See, he has abandoned his best friend. Can you do that to your best friend? I see every possible scenario that would have disqualified God because of what happened on that one death only. Another example I'll give you is in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of St. Mark, the 37th verse. A strong storm, a great storm of wind, hits when Jesus and his disciples are on a boat. And when the waves beat the ship, the water starts to come in and it starts to feel. But the Bible says, but Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. The brother is sleeping. So they come to him and wake him up and they say, Carest thou not that we perish? Simpler English, don't you care that we perish? Of course, these people knew that this man was God, right? If, if this boat was going down, this guy just walks on water and walks away. You see? That's why they didn't say, wake up and we save our lives. No. You don't care that we are also going, we are going to die. You will know, you can just float. But don't you care that we are going to die? Third example is in Matthew 15, 22. A woman comes out of the coast of Canaan. She has a child which is grievously vexed with the devil. So she comes to Jesus and says, I have a child who is grievously vexed with the devil. She's possessed by demons. They are strangling her. This child is about to die and she's weeping. This is a mother's tears it's coming from in there it's deep and the bible says she screams and says son of david have mercy on me my daughter is grievously vexed with a devil and the bible says jesus answered her not a word he didn't answer her he didn't respond to her you know she speaks he looks at her like this and then goes back. And then I also imagine the situation if Jesus was in 2023 and he had a mobile phone. Right? And I'm sure if Jesus was in 2023, he would have a Samsung, not Apple. <laughs> I 
I know Apple people are now looking at me with these eyes of Apple soul. You think you'd have a techno? Anyway. Okay, let's imagine he had an Apple or a Samsung. Let's just imagine that. He has his phone here or a techno or a Huawei. So Jesus is on a phone like this. The woman comes and says, help me, help me, my child is dying. And then he looks at her like this and then he continues on his phone. Imagine there was a passerby watching that. He would think, wow. What a rude man. Are you seeing this? Are you seeing this? And so the Bible says, the moment he does that, and I want you to picture this, the disciples of Jesus come and say, let's send this woman away. She's crying after us. She's disturbing us. She's telling, they're telling Jesus, like how some of my security people behave. I was sharing in the first service that, you know, when, when you are working in ministry and serving, there's a wisdom you need when you're dealing with people. Of course, the people we're dealing with are not all okay. Some people here, if you check them, that they're not okay. Not everybody's okay. But you must understand that they are still human beings. You must know how to deal with people. You can say no in a humble way. You can say no in wisdom. Some of you, some of you are ushers, but you're rude to people. No, I told you don't sit there. Sit. No, 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 no. Don't be like Jesus' disciples. Don't be like them. Because that was not the heart of Jesus. But some of you misrepresent our heart. They pushed me. Why would you push a person? Use wisdom. You can even use force wisely. So you would not misrepresent my heart or the heart of God. Because we are all ministers of the gospel. Because some of you people can also be overbearing. You're very, some of you can be very complicated. You can abuse, you insult, and these people are human beings too. But because you're a minister, you should know how to respond to that. If you're an usher, the people you're going to deal with are all, some are entitled, some are victimized, some are, you know, wherever, whatever version they come in, you must know how to deal with everyone wherever they are. So, the disciples, you remember one time they, they even pushed children out? Yeah. Jesus had to tell them, no, 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 no. Why, why are you pushing this kid? How do you get a two-year-old? I said, go, go, go. Hey, hey, hey. Security, disciples. <laughs> you can carry them. Be, Hello, how are you? Where are you? Can I take you for candy? But don't push the child. But for, in Jesus' story, it says, let them come. So That's why I see children. That day, mean, eh? You're going to bring all your kids to me. No. Be considerate, some of you. Now you've dedicated how many kids today? More than 30. And all of you want me to see your kids today? I rebuke you in Jesus' name. So, they say, let's chase this woman away. And Jesus adds insult to injury. Or injury to insult. And he says... I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Not only am I ignoring you, but I want you to also know I am ignoring you. I am ignoring you because I was not sent to you. I was sent to the lost house of Israel. What was this woman to think? Now, if you did not understand the heart of God and why this event happened in history, some of you, the way you're easily offended, already you'll be up in arms. Mm. Who do you think you are? Huh? You think we want your miracles? Huh? I know, I know, I, I know how some people are. I know how some people are. They can even want to fight. Why? Why have you refused to heal my child? What did this one do that others didn't do? You know? You take it 
very emotionally. But this was not the heart of God. There was something he was up to. And how do I know that? Go back to the issue of Lazarus. Was Lazarus raised from the dead? Answer me. Was Lazarus raised from the dead? Let's go back to the issue of them in the ship which was about to capsize. Did Jesus calm that storm? Let's go to the story of this lady with a child which was possessed by devils. Was that child made whole? See, this is the heart of God. But I said, when you go through hard times, it is easy for you to judge the heart of God. Because you have not yet matured in the knowledge of him. That is what he says in Psalms, verse chapter 103, verse 7. The Bible says, He made known His ways unto Moses, comma, His acts unto the children of Israel. Moses knew the ways of God. Israel knew the acts of God. They knew what he does. Moses knew how he does it. Why he does what he does. Those are two different kinds of people. There's a people who only know what God can do. And there's a people who know how and why he does what he does. When you mature and come here, you learn not to question God's judgment. You learn how not to question the ways in which he does what he does. Hallelujah, somebody. Hallelujah, somebody. I think it was Paul in Romans chapter 11, verses 33. He called it the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge, he said, of God. And he says, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. God does not think like human beings. Remember, in his hands, you are clay. He's the porter. He created you. He created your mind, this mind that you use to judge him. He created it. He made it. He knows all the neurons and how it's wired within there. He knows how it functions and the extent of its liberties. Are you following what I'm saying? I'll give you an example that is common with us that you could understand as human beings. I shared a story in the first service of my father when I was little. There were times you'd come to him and say, Dad, I want money for this, so I want money for this, I want you to buy me this, and I want you to buy me that. And in those early, in the 90s, or and now it, it rarely happens, but in the 90s, many of you remember our parents used to put their monies in their stockings. How many of you saw your parents? Do that. Put up your hands. If you saw your father do that, yeah. So they used to get money. Those of you who didn't put up your hands, were your fathers rich? Did your fathers have any money? Did they have enough wallets? Big wallets? Wallets big enough to hold 5 million, 10 million? No. Briefcase. Somebody said, my dad used the briefcase. Wow. Okay. Well, mine didn't have that much to put in a briefcase like some other people here. So, he, he, one of those evenings, he would come back and he has like bundles here. Mm, bundles stuck here. Mm. And back in the day, the, the trousers were not as slim as ours. They were really big things. They were like dressed in tents. <laughs> Some time ago, I saw my father's old suits. I, I said, these guys, they were put on like a tent. You, the jacket, the, the, the suit is this big. And, but they were happy. In their eyes, they were smart. <laughs> so anyway, so I used to pack money there and there and then fill all his socks and some of them would expand and he can't put them on anymore because they were holding money. Now, of course, I learned one of those days I was in their bedroom just browsing around. You know how kids can be bored. What's here? What's there? 
one of those days I land on the place where this man used to keep all his money. And my jaw was like, car. This ninja has money. And so I get angry. Because how can you have this much money? And I'm asking for little money, very little. Bike, what? I just very little money. And you can't give it to me. How rude can this man be? And then I started to admire other people's fathers. You know that, that you know, when you're a kid, you easily disqualify your parent. They annoy you a bit and you say, ha, ah, I wish I was this person's child. Why? Because we saw them give their children some amounts of money. And as I'm maturing, one day it dawns on me that whatever my, ha my father had in those stockings or hidden stuck somewhere was his working capital. That the business he was running was a capital intensive business that needed you to invest money to buy goods, get those goods into a shop to sell and then make profit, remove operating expenses, have an income and that little income Pay school fees for your children, buy food for them, give them clothes, look after your parents, your siblings, and everybody that will have a need. That was a certain place of maturity. At that age, I was unable to judge right the actions of my father. But this touches earthly beings. Some of you can understand what I'm trying to say. Now, if my dad gave me everything that I needed, it would mean that I would not have school fees. I would not have an opportunity to have a decent education. Are you following what I'm saying? But it had to take the mind or the wisdom of a man who knew that he was in charge. I call it the responsibility of guardianship. Some of you don't know how powerful this word guardian is. A guardian is responsible firstly for the protection of those people he's in charge over. And protection is multidimensional. It's not the wild animals that are going to break through this house and come to attack you. But it's those other things that you're not able to understand or explain because you have not died in life long enough. Or it's not simply given to you to know because it's not your place to know. And I have seen God sometimes not speak to us because it's just not for us to know certain things. Because he's our guardian. So when you are a guardian in a household, you're responsible to protect of the things that are seen, the things that are not seen. To educate, to under guard, you know, to direct, to instruct. All of that is the responsibility of a guardian. And so the price that comes with that, the maturity that comes with that, the wisdom that comes with juggling all of these things and putting parts together, it's not an easy responsibility like some of you think. That is why some of you now in your 40s and 50s are starting to ask, how did my father even manage to build a house, take all the kids to school? Because your two kids are a problem. Your those two. The two kids you have in your house are a problem. But then you go back to the men who raised eight or 10 or 12 of them, plus your cousins and your, you know, your, your, you know, your neighbors, kids, and some of you, your parents extended, you know, their, their, their generous hands to people you were not related to, shared beds with them, food with them, and everything with them, and ask yourself, how would this guy run this whole household a whole week? Yet I'm struggling to plan for one child and a daughter. I mean, my, my son in the house with my, with my wife. That's the power of guardianship, to understand what it means to be a guardian. And those, like I said, are multidimensional, there are levels to that. When you become a husband to a woman, a wife, you are her guardian. You will find that there's sometimes as a man, decisions you will make to safeguard her, to safeguard the children. And sometimes your wife might understand your children might understand. Sometimes they might not understand because the responsibility is with you as a man. Now I'm talking to men 
who are in charge of their houses. I'm not talking about those ones <laughs> who when the bill comes, they say, Mama. No, no, no. I'm talking, I'm talking to people who know, to men who know that I'm in charge of the well-being of my household. You will realize the pressures we go through. Because you wake up one day and you're looking for these thousands of dollars, but your child might not know. Even your wife might not know. And this brain has to go around adding this and that and that and that to make sure that at the end of the day they survive. Whether the business worked or it did not work, the point is the kids need the milk. They need the pampers. They need everything working. The electricity must be on. The internet must work. You must, your brain has to find all these things to make things work. Reconcile all these things, sorry, to make things work. Now as a guardian, you understand what I'm saying. Not everything you know and experience you'll share. There are things you might not be able to explain because in trying to explain them, you'll conflict with your faith. Are you following what I'm saying? So, but if you're a man and you're married to a builder, because you know some women are builders, some, are, some aren't, you know, it, 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 it comforts you because sometimes you're in a place uh, where you're confused. Proverbs 14, one comes in. The Bible says that a wise woman buildeth, you know, a house, her house, buildeth, you know. If you have a builder, the builder comes and say, no, you know, uh, my husband, here you spent this much, but I think you shouldn't have spent this. I think we could have found a way of cancelling this and that to make sure that we save off some little money because next year we might need fees for the two kids. That's a builder. You can't be married to that kind of woman and be poor. You get it? But then you have women who are not builders at all. She will also be like the children. I don't care where you get the money. Brother, I want my wig money. I'm in trouble TikTok. I hope my spiritual daughters understand that I'm speaking in love. Because this you don't do for your husband, you do for your household. You do for your children. I know single mothers who have had to raise children in the absence of their father. Fathers, either the fathers left or some died. But if she was not a builder, her children would not go to school. And that's why I celebrate single mothers who have made it. Come on, let's celebrate them. They are paying fees. They are, you know, they are feeding the kids. They are guardians. The mind is there. Are you following what I'm saying? So it is with God. He's our guardian. There are things that in your estimate you need urgently. But your guardian says, this is not good for you now. And the wisdom to tell the difference. Because if I go back a bit on the parents, your child comes in the morning and says, I want sweets. And then you go buy 20 cans of sweets. Put them in the house. Every time you want baby, come and eat candy. Come and eat. The kid wants candy in the morning, wants chocolate during day, wants a chocolate fudge in the evening. Once a black forest at night. And this kid is eating sugar every day. I've met some of your kids from east to west. Their teeth are dark. Now, their children whose teeth are burnt because of uh, uh, these little medicines they take. Syrups, eh? So don't judge every kid's teeth who are burnt. Besides their milk, permanent will come. But there are kids whose teeth are fried because some of you parents don't care about your children. And I want to rebuke you on that. How can you feed a kid sugar in the morning? Sugar at 10 a.m. Sugar at midday. Sugar at 2 p.m. Sugar at, at, at 6, 4 p.m. Sugar in the evening. You know, you, you, you're killing your child. Right? You know 
as a parent, one day, a child comes and says, mommy, I want cake, and you tell them you're not going to have cake. In your estimate, you feel this kid has had more sugar than they should have, because that's what a parent does. But are you going to tell me you're going to choose to say, I ah, know, if my kid wants a cake, they get a cake whenever they want a cake. That's why some of you people are spoiled, because your parents fed your cravings. Every time you wanted something, it was available. Now, you don't know how to live in a world where certain things are not available. You'd conflict. You can't munch in the middle. Mm -mm. Lunch time was lunch time. Eat all you want. You can't munch in the middle. Wait for evening tea if you want and some little dinner. That's it. But some of you, the fridge was open to you. January to December. And that's what you're doing to your children as an expression of love. That's not love. Parents, that's not love. Seriously. I promise, one time I went to a school, uh, an international school, and I find a kid, he's eight and he can't walk. I promise you, the kid is eight and he can't walk. And in his hand, he's holding one of the highest cholesterol burgers I've ever seen. I kid you not, I saw it with my eyes. Huge burger like this, it has every kind of cheese in it. And this kid's indulging. Eight years, he can't breathe. His friends are, I, I promise you, I saw it with my eyes. His friends are running and he can't literally breathe. And I'm thinking, why, why would a parent do this to their own child? Are you following what I'm saying? Maybe this parent was raised in poverty and they promised themselves that when I grow up, my, whatever my child wants to eat, they eat. No, 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 no. God will judge you for that because it was your responsibility to raise that child in the way that they should work. Yeah. When a child grows to understand that not everything you want, you shall have every time you want to have it because the judgment of life and the way of natural justice does not provide for that. You're raising the right citizen. You're raising the right individual. Even if you don't clap, I don't care. <laughs> Are you learning something? Yes. And it might involve some discipline. I was telling you in the first service, my mother was a very good woman. She never used to beat us. No. She just used to lay hands on us and cast out devils, cleanse lepers, and sometimes the, it was not hands, sometimes it was the hangers, anything that was close. She just used to lay it on you. And then wisdom comes. Whether it's a shoe, so shoes taught us, <laughs> cups taught us, you know. <laughs> By the time I was 12 years old, when we were 12, 13, he would, she, she never used to touch us anymore. By the time a tight, if you teach a child obedience the first seven years of their lives, you will tell when they are 12. Because I remember every time we went into 13, my mother never touched us again. But up till today, I still kneel before her. I can't answer my mother back. That woman put something in this head. I fear her. If she calls me, I feel like a, a, lioness, a lioness is roaring somewhere. Grace! She's like, Grace! But I hear, why? <laughs> But I thank God for her. But there was a time she laid hands on me and I told her, you're not my mother. And she's as, she's a Mnyankor as they come. She told me, you're also not my son. In fact, I've been looking at you recently. You do, you're, not, you're not my son. My son can't think like you. <laughs> if I could pack your bags, because... What, what, what is another child doing in my house? I want to raise my own children. Go ahead. It became a big deal. I also had to repent on that one. Oh, come your son, but you ever laid hands on me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You over? Laid hands on me. Spare the rod. Yeah. So anyway, but I think, and I believe that it would start discipline that has allowed me to be able to minister to you. You get my point? Yeah. 
guardian. I've used all these examples to show you that God, this God we serve, is your guardian as well. And there are things he will let in your life, not because he hates you or he doesn't love you. Known are his ways from the beginning. He knows what he's doing. Trust him. He knows what he's doing. He knows how everything that's disturbing you can bring glory one day. He knows. He's God. He is God. He's God. I gave a story in the first service that I had once. It's a common story among a few people of a story I'm told back in the day. I think it was cod fish. Was it fish? Cod fish? So they used to, back in the day, people used to eat a lot of it. And um, many companies used to struggle, I think, in transporting it. Could have been cod, unless otherwise, but I remember like it was cod fish. So many companies, if not cod, it's, it's some fish. But many companies used to struggle uh, transporting it. And they discovered one thing, that when they put fish in, um, in say, ice, right? in ice boxes, whenever this fish, would, this, fish would, this fish would get to destination, they were not testing well. They were not as tasty as they did test when they were fresh from the water body. So they f f uh, designed another means to keep this fish fresh by building some water uh, ponds or something like that, some water ponds and then putting these fish in and then transporting them while in the water. So when they get to the destination X, they just get them out and then they test fresh. When they tried that also, the fish, was not, the fish were not testing well because there was a certain test that a fresh fish had, a cod fish had. But every time it was transported, even in water, while it had the opportunity to swim, in the environment like it would in a water body it was just not testing right so they discovered that there was just one missing uh, element in what they saw in the water bodies and what was in these ponds right these moving ponds and they discovered that these caught fish were living in terrain where there were catfish eh? and these catfish used to chase them around right so they tried an experiment where they get this catfish and put it in the same what ponds, these moving ponds with the codfish. And they discovered that when they reached the destination, the codfish were testing fresh. Who got it? Who got it? Yeah. So it meant that this fish could not test fresh except they coexisted with the catfish. And the catfish used to chase them every time to eat them. So what, what you could do, for example, is you get a younger catfish, which might not be able to eat, but still it's a catfish. When it sees a catfish, it what? It runs. So some of you are like codfish. You, 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 you survive best when you're under some sort of attack. That's why some of you, when you're under attack, you pray. You, you pray. When attack sees relax. James 1.3. Read the message version. James 1.3. It says, you know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true what? Ah, some of you are like that. If you want to know a Christian who is alive, some of you, you need to be under some sort of attack. Tomorrow, your car got an accident and then next thing you don't have fees and then you have a headache and then after that, you lose your job. Those kinds of Christians pray. Because the catfish is always after them. Some of you exist or oh, function best when you have something nudging you. If you're not prompted by some sort of trouble, you can't pray. They tell them, ha, huh, we saw the list. It seems that the company is downsizing, but I think I saw your, your name. It's number two. <laughs> Wake up at 2 a.m., you hear the dear brother, Moko Shakata, Zobra de Gatako, Masaka, Taka, 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 
takata. They will not fire me. They will not fire me. They will not. Fire. They even sweat. You find a, a, a fellow. You tell him, "I want to take you for lunch." He said, "No." Fasting. Why? I want to see God. Ooh. What do you mean you want to see God, James? What do you mean you want to see God? James wants to see God come through that letter that could come any time. And then as faithful as God is, he breaks through. And then they say, ah, we looked at the list. You were spared. Then he goes and buys himself a gigantic bagger and a two-liter Coca-Cola. That evening, I kid you not, his prayer is, Father, thank you for today. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh. <laughs> Next day, they come into the bedroom. Father, oh. Then they wake up at four. I forgot to pray. Father, oh. 6 a.m. alarm. Oh. They dress up and run to work. One, two, three weeks, you ask them, but do you pray? I've been struggling in prayer. Lately, I've been struggling in prayer. Send them a catfish. <laughs> You'll see Intercessor 101. Demon Chaser. Spirit Filled Bazooka. Evil Spirit Annihilator. Every title. Master Rebuker. <laughs> <laughs> but you need a maturity that doesn't need to be tested by catfish you need an intimacy that does not need to be defined by the circumstances or prevailing situations that you're in to get to a point where you can have your three four five hours not because you have a problem at your job or your marriage is breaking or your ministry is under attack but because you love the lord jesus you have to mature otherwise you'll never understand god as you must So they say that, uh, I think one Christian joked and said, uh, some Christians are in the habit of making what they call ambulance prayers. Your prayers are always, well, the, the picture of a person who is about to die and they call an ambulance, we call them ambulance prayers. Some of you, you're always on damage control. Wee -oo, wee -oo. In the spirit realm, the angels hear, wee -oo, wee -oo, wee -oo, wee -oo, wee -oo. Beep, 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 beep. That's that's how heaven hears the, the traffic in the you're, you're disturbing and some of them are, are praising God they're they're driving right in heaven for you you emergency you're always in an emergency mode <laughs> are you learning something? Build a love relationship with God where you don't need problems to seek Him. But back to what I was saying because I'm about to finish. You read scripture and start to see even the things you might never understand in your own mind being easily understood when you get to know God and his heart otherwise i know people who no longer come to church because they judged god foolishly you remember when the bible speaks of the affliction on job do you know what it's like for the most righteous man a man whom god boasts over do you know that he says he escueth evil the bible says he is a perfect and an upright man one that feareth god and escueth evil job was a good man 
And then he buries his kids, his animals. And tomorrow he is filled with boils. And the Bible says, but in all of this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Some of you, that's where you start. I'm done with God. I, I, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done with I, I, I can't even go to church anymore. I mean, if he cares, why would he let this happen to me? It becomes so about you that you lose the picture of what he's trying to, dis, to, to, to display to you. Look at the lady, the, this, this woman who uh, had come with a child who's, which was uh, possessed by devils. Do you know that God, Jesus Christ, did that action? to help the Gentiles understand that he did not come for the Jew only, but for the Gentile also. This was the only way, because if you go time in memorial, read from Genesis, you realize that the children of Israel were confident, or at least the whole world at that particular point, alluded to one reality that God had only chosen one race and only one on the, on the earth, and that was the Jews. Any other person which was not a Jew, was not God's choice. At least that's how they lived. This realization that God had called the Gentiles was a New Testament experience that came through Revelation. And it begins with this testimony. A woman was denied to provoke her to believe God for Jesus to reveal something that no Gentile at that particular point knew that God is no respecter of persons like Peter says when he goes to the house of Cornelius preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised which had not had anything about God he said of the truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted by him the Bible says he is Lord of all and reach unto all these experiences that you see now later peter and paul are farming they began by the experience of a woman which seemed like she was being rejected by the very god who she had come to for salvation and it could only have happened if he did what he did so you see if somebody was just a bypasser and they only experienced that event they would have judged the heart of god that was not the heart of God. The heart of God was for the salvation and healing of all mankind. Who wills that all men be saved and that they might come to the knowledge of the truth. That's why in the book of Revelation, now you have not 12, but the 144 elders. That is 12 times 12. The total number of them which were luminaries in the tribe of Israel, the supposed nation chosen by God, and the number 12 also representative the, of the luminaries which were chosen in the Gentile world. So it's 12 times 12 that gives you 144. He says, I heard of the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed of 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, of this Israel, it's not Israel by blood or lineage, but it is Israel because they have been grafted in through faith what a mystery what a mystery but you see revelation 7 4 can only be explained by a woman who was denied who seemed to be going through a rejection but it's only the heart of God that we see and understand. That is why in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15, he says, we don't have a high priest, read the Amplified Version, who is, not, who is unable to understand and sympathize and have a shared feeling with our weakness and infirmities and liability to the assaults of temptation, but one who has been tempted in every respect as we are yet without sinning. The priest that we are serving is touched by our infirmities, by our liabilities. He sympathizes and understands with every assault and temptation that you've gone through. He understands and he feels the pain you feel. That is why the Bible says, moved with compassion, he healed all which were sick. Even the woman he seems to have turned from, he had compassion for. That's the heart of God. That's the heart of God. But he too went through what you went through, or some of you have gone through. Even worse than some of you because you have not been crucified. You don't know what it's like to be on the cross. Of nails going through your palms. You've not been rejected like Jesus was rejected. The scriptures tell us on the cross. 
he turns to Mary and says, woman, behold your son. And he points at John. And then he tells John, John, behold your mother. And that day, the Bible says, John took her and to his home. John 19 verses 27. He took Mary unto his home. The moment Jesus breathed his last. Why? Because in Jewish culture, when a man died, the responsibility of looking after that mother or the wife he had left was put on a child. The first child, the son, the eldest son, took the responsibility of looking after his mother. And in this instance, Jesus was the one looking after his mother, presupposing that Joseph was no longer in picture. That means Joseph had died earlier. How many questions go around just that thought? That God in the flesh was raised by a man who died earlier than we expected, who evidently did not live his full life, but he died in the house of Jesus Christ. He's raising all the dead and making the crippled walk and the blind are seeing the dumb are speaking and the deaf are hearing. And he can't raise his own father. But as true as it is, by that time, Joseph had gone. That's why he's not in the picture. So if you say I'm an orphan, Joseph went, Jesus went through it. The only difference is that he had a relationship with his heavenly father. And so the comfort was, was there. But also too, he knew the counsel of God in those matters. I gave an example in the first service. Three years before, the Lord appeared to me and told me, I want to take your father. Three years before. And I asked for more time and I prayed to God. I said, give him more time. We, we, we talked, literally. And he added him a few years. I remember, and these things I don't tell my family because I hate relay, relay, relieving this. But I remember three weeks before my father goes to heaven, I was driving out and the very voice of God comes and he's, I could sense Christ just seated in my chair here. And he says, Grace, I'm taking him. He's going. But I need to give you the peace and grace to handle this because I know who he is to you. He was my best friend. Some people's best friends are, my father was my best friend. Now, it's as hard as that can be, all of those three weeks before my father sent it, these were days of fighting in my heart. No, no, no. But there was this voice telling me, everything is going to be okay. And I remember people speaking to me, speaking to me, and a woman walked to me while people were speaking. And I had a voice. A certain lady walked to me. I don't remember even her face. She said, people were telling me, everyone was telling me comforting words. But one lady came and said, God is still in charge. And then she walked away. Now, people continued speaking and the voice again came back and he said, I have spoken through that one. I looked around because there were many people moving around me, but I don't remember the face up to today. But I remember the voice of the person who told me, God is still in charge. And I had God. That was the one word I remember I had had three, week, three weeks ago. He told me I'm in charge. I'm still God. Everything is going to be okay. You get my point? Now, I'm helping some of you who probably have gone through even worse than I have. But to know that the heart of God was revealed to me before this man ascended, even the morning he was going, when they called me, the voice told me, today is the day. I drove straight to get to him. You get? Because I knew. I knew. When you know him, he doesn't get you offside. You know. You know. And I know where my father is. I know. You get my point? So the, those words comfort us in such a way that nobody, when the Bible says that you may be comforted with the very comfort with which he comforted Christ. You must know the heart of God in sitting down with a 33-year-old boy and he has to convince him your life is not going to be no more. You're not going to live to have a wife and children and enjoy life and live full as you should. I need to comfort you enough to carry this cup for the good of the salvation of all mankind. If it be possible, he's in the garden of Gethsemane, take this cup 
of me. But if it be your will, that's a comforted man, so be it. He says yes to the cross. What was it like for Mary to bury her 33-year-old son which had done nothing to any man? But this is the very right that you have to lift your hands every Thursday, every Sunday, every day of your life, expressing gratitude to God for his overwhelming and indescribable gift and expression of love to you that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died. One man's sacrifice. I know heaven Heaven wept that day. God wept that day. Mary wept that day. Why didn't you choose another son? Why would it have to be mine? Why would I have to see this in a lifetime? Because no parent wants to bury their own child. But all things work together for good for them that love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. God wants you to build some muscle. He wants you to mature to a place where nothing and I mean nothing that would happen in your life would make you deny him. In every change, he abides faithful. He abides faithful. You could have gone through all the worst storms man could ever spell and you can still stand with every ounce of conviction in your being from your core and say, God is Good. that's maturity that's maturity that is the very reason why as Hebrews 15 now the 16th verse says we can fearlessly and confidently draw boldly to the throne of grace because we know we can receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need appropriate help well timed help coming just when we need it God is never let He's never let. He's never let. He's never let. You see, you see the heart of God. Trust Him. Some of you might or have received yours back. Some of you haven't received yours back. You can still trust Him. He's faithful. He's faithful. This is a sermon today. Learn to trust God even in the hardest times. Don't crack. Don't break. Let's get to our feet. I want you to take a few minutes and have a personal talk with God. Personal talk with God. Personal talk with God. Open your mouth and speak to Jesus. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him but I'll maintain my own ways before him. I will behave as I ought and carry the discipline he expects of a man who knows him and has walked with him. Don't deny God because your, your marriage has failed. Don't draw back because your kids are, uh, your child is autistic. Don't, don't, you know, don't, don't give up because you have a health issue you've, you've failed to fix. Keep on the course. The heart of God is very clear. The Bible says, for we see of the sufferings of our brother Job and the end of the Lord that he is merciful, pitiful to all. God is faithful. It will end well. It will end well. I know you've carried a disease for so long that's disturbing you. It will end well. Eventually, one day, you're going to walk into that room and they won't find that cancer. They won't find that disease in the blood. They won't be there. Hallelujah. But God is calling you to trust him. Trust him. Raise your hands and speak to Jesus. Speak to Jesus. Speak to Jesus. So let go my soul and trust in Him. The weather means still no his name so let go my soul and trust in him the waves I need still know his name so let go my soul and trust Away from you, still know 
more his day. So let it go, I saw a chance pray for you that God will strengthen you that he will fortify your spirit to stand in the times of adversity and never 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 draw back to perdition but believe to the saving of the soul all your days are inscribed in his palm he has numbered them, even the hairs on your head. He cares for you. He feels every pain you're feeling, even more than you do because he created these people. Trust that there is an end to this and that it is well. In Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. Come on, let's celebrate Jesus. Let's celebrate Jesus. Let's celebrate Jesus. Let's celebrate Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Some of you are here and you've never given your life to Christ. And you say, you know, pastors, you're preaching. I feel I need to give my life to Jesus. There's somebody you've been going through pain of a loss and only God can heal you. Only God. No psychiatrist, no psychoanalyst, no, no shrink. No one can heal you except God. So if you're there and you want to give your life to Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to come and receive him as your Lord and Savior. Come and I pray with you. Come and I pray with you. Be still my soul The Lord is on your side
Jesus, because he died for my sins and was raised for my glory. Today, I receive Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm born again. Amen. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the decision these ones have made. Strengthen them. Preserve them. Deliver them. Teach them, help them. I decree and I declare whatever spirits have been disturbing and troubling your life. Go, you spirits of darkness. I command you to leave God's people. And I decree and I declare that from today, you walk in freedom. And may God lighten whatever burden was on your heart in Jesus' mighty name. And all saints said, Amen. You're going to go with these people. I just want to take your names and numbers and help you understand what it means to be born again. Parents, wherever your children are, if you have a child here, follow them after service. You know, some of them want to leave Uganda and go to America. So make sure they, they don't disappear at the airport. Please follow them. See you on the 31st. So, yes. Next Thursday, we're, gonna, we're not going to have service. We're not going to have service on Sunday. We're not going to have service on Christmas. Christmas Day, we're going to have carols on Manifest Television, on YouTube, and any other platforms that we have. I want the team, the setup team, to take some time as well and rest and go be with their wives so they can come fresh next year when they're not being chased by catfish. Yeah? Yeah? Hey, don't stack the chairs. Leave the chairs because the, the, we're going to use them for the afternoon. Okay, see you. This broadcast was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information about the great work of God, visit us on the web at www.fenero.org or download the Fenero app today and enjoy sermons, daily devotionals, and timely updates. The Fenero app, available on both Google Play and Apple App Store. You may also email us at info at finero.org. Follow us on social media platforms on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Finero, make manifest.